I want to talk a little bit about real human presence. On the top floor of the Shanghai Museum, the permanent collection of their highest art form is on display. It's calligraphy, it's graphic design. And embodied in every one of these brush strokes is the recorded second of one's very being. You know? I mean, look at this moment here. We've all sort of experienced this sensibility within ourselves, and here it is recorded. My favorite piece, however, is called the Preface to the Orchid Pavilion. It's a really long scroll. It's from the Song Dynasty. It's 3,000 years old. And as you can see, it's covered in a rash of chops, these red stamps. I asked my translator, I said, did the calligrapher go nuts at the end of this piece? Why all the chops? And she said, excuse me, those are the people who saw this piece and experienced the message maker's presence and responded by placing their chop on his work. They returned the call. They retweeted. <laughs> now, who among us does not feel compelled to reach out and shake another person's hand when they offer to shake hands? We can't ignore the compelling aspect of real human presence, yet as designers and communicators, we're really quick to sort of step both feet into the puddle of formula, of methodologies that yield a kind of inhuman conversation. And we wonder, why don't they make contact? Why aren't they forever? You see, all of us, since the early petroglyphs, have this need to be seen and heard. It's at the heart of all communication. Here's the thing, nowadays we ask design to mediate our connections. We ask design to sort of catalyze a connection between one person and another. You know, when we customize and personalize design work, it's a shout out of our own longing to be present. Like, hey, look at me. Even if it's just like, I need this particular size, or I'd love my iPod to be gold. You know, Flickr, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Foursquare, they're all just symptomatic of our need to be present. And you know, while I can sort of gloss over all that, I think that's sort of uh, the secret sauce and the holy grail of what we should be focused on. Because we cannot go through another sort of generation of the stuff that is so inauthentic, it should numb our souls. And as designers and marketeers, you know, we're like the purveyors of this crap. The wonderful thing about static graphic design like calligraphy is it does record those moments. And for me, I've had some experiences as I use the medium of design as sort of like personal notations to self. When I was young, you know, I, that must have been like in the 90s, I saw myself saying, you know, hey, love me, I look cooler than the next guy. As the decade was turning and the millennium was approaching, I painted this picture for Wired Magazine. It says, you know, I wonder if I'll have anything profound to say as I was imagining communication in the year 2525, when there we are, hold up, you know, sending these stylistic smoke screens to one another, smoke signals that look kind of cool. As time went on, I discovered I was kind of in a hurry, and I don't know where I was running to, but I had to remind myself and those who listen that it's okay, just relax. The average lifespan is 2.3 billion seconds. A few years ago, I discovered that I was uh, morphing, at almost 60 years old, and so I used again design to tell myself, it's okay to be the grown-up Game Boy. And then I had to uh, sort of realize I was awash in a new kind of humility, not evident on the stage, however, and that said, you know, I'm a genius, but it doesn't make me special. I could say that to myself and share it with you today. And just as last year came to an end, I discovered that, oh my, it's like deja vu all over again. I feel like I've sort of tapped into a new reservoir inside myself and uh, the meaningful was coming back. But I do remember that in 2007, it was kind of dark for me. I was sort of looking out and saying, you know, 
I don't see any future for me in my profession of design. My shingle of huge hype was sort of flickering outside my office as the transformers acted up. And there I was, like, full of remorse, like, oh, God. I have, you know, 20 more years to go. Is this all there is? And so I took my Mies van der Rohe apartment as it looked out over Lincoln Park onto the skyline and tossed everything out of it and decided I was going to return to the Shanghai Museum experience. And I was going to do for myself what I saw these calligraphers do. I was going to find a connection within. I was going to record myself. So I got some Sumi ink and I got some Reeves paper and I started to paint not with brushes. That would have been too steep a learning curve. I painted with turkey basting syringes and foam brushes. But, you know, 575 drawings over eight months, I uh, talked to myself and made a connection with the dark side. So here's a little video clip of some of these dark moments. You know, it's really notes to self. I let gravity sort of play in it as I made these marks every night on the, on the wall. And by the time the year was up and I was on like drawing 500, the line quality had gotten very smooth and sort of relaxed as if toxins had been sort of shot right out of my blood system. It's kind of weird for me to look at these. So we're going to just stop this. Ooh, creepy, creepy. Okay. At the end of it, however, I, I had a lesson. And the lesson was that I was committed to make certain that the form that came from my studio, the form that was under my direction, would be alive. I didn't know exactly how that would manifest, and I still don't, but I know that's worth a lifetime of experimentation and research. Sure enough, the next project arrives. I have this drawing from Paris, and I'm told to announce in one month this light installation that will appear in Chicago. It's huge, it fills this room. But that's all I had. I decided to get the artist from Paris on the phone. And I recorded the speakerphone call with one of those little Mac snowballs. I built this storyboard that said, okay, on a gradual narrative arc towards enlightenment, his voice and the code line from his voice was going to activate our sort of replicant of his lamp. It was posted, these 15 minutes of Eric's fame, on the Right 20 website in Chicago. My name is Eric Levy, and this is my first uh, great exhibition in America. So I have a very strong relationship with nature because I, um, I believe that the source, the best source of inspiration is, is nature through the observation or the experiences that Here's what Eric has to say. You get the idea that lasted for 15 minutes of Eric talking. My voice was cut out of it. When Rick first talked to me about this idea, I could only imagine something in my head. And when I saw it the first time, it was, like people say, I've seen the light, but I've seen the voice. And that is a fantastic uh, experience because the vibration of the voice that I feel when I talk in my throat has been totally transmitted into, into a visual. And the fact that we are zooming in and out, and it's about space, uh, that what's voice is actually filling up the space. And in the installation itself, side by side to the sparkler video, it has exactly the same, these moments where it blinks in the same time, and it has the same vibration. OK, so one needs to ask, does every project get a video? No. Does real human presence have a way into all communication? Maybe. How does it work when we're using real human presence to sell stuff? In 1998, I was asked by Herman Miller to create communication around a marketing script for their Neocon sales presentation. I invited two dancers to respond to this script. They were tethered in early motion capture devices. You know, it wasn't Avatar. And as I read the script, they would move, they would twitch. It was a lie detector that was physical. 
We took that code and all of that code made transitions between color and body movements. It was our sort of automatic keyframing. As the new logo went across the screen, it was actually moved across the screen by the virtual arm moving in space. It was compelling. It was compelling in a way that through the 20,000 square feet in this showroom, 50,000 people stopped at these five little pylons that had three big screens on it. It was a kind of homage to real human presence in a way that was breathtaking. We just had no idea like why when they have other showrooms like Steelcase and Hayworth and Knoll to go to, why were they sort of like around these digital campfires? So here's just a glimpse of our test. I mean, if you've seen Avatar, this is like nothing. But somehow, we were able to make the form come alive. You know, we would look to Calder, we would look to Eames, and we would say, oh my, marry this with the messaging of marketing, and they connect. I'll just show you one little transition here as this turns into kind of a beautiful three-dimensional form that should inspire the architect in all of us. And you can see here it's like little, you know, just like Lego figures. And it's really twitchy. It's like that early technology. The code was not very smooth. We were trying to fix it. It was like, forget about it. It's sort of like the cell phones that look like walkie-talkies. Okay. Along with Jeannie Gang, who's an architect in Chicago, and artist Janet Eckelman, I had the privilege of collaborating on a memorial to the 57 victims of 9-11 from Hoboken, New Jersey. We conceived an island out into the Hudson River, 40-foot approach to that island. And in this contemplative space, we created an abyss. And around the abyss, we had 57 pieces of glass, each one with the name and birth date. We all knew when they passed inside the open space was a message. But on the 40 feet to the island, there were just handrails. It was like, no, this is the moment where we can create the establishing shot and do the denouement on the way out. And so we cast in bronze, or at least that's the plan, the excerpts from the survivors the messages that they had to say. And we edited them and returned them, and in their own hand, they placed their story. By casting this in bronze, it will be touched. Now, how does real human presence work in branding and identity? I posit it works really good, we just haven't touched it. We're still in the mode of the passive identity. At best, we have like the AOL identity that's occasionally different, you know, or the MTV or the old, what was that one, the absolute identity. Now here, this is a proposal for the Third Coast Audio Festival in Chicago. And in yellow, it says third. In blue, it says coast. In green, it says audio. And in pink, it says festival. We looked and discovered that some sound is round. And we said, let's take those words, and at each moment of their attack, let's put them on a concentric circle. Let's let the volume adjust the contour. Let's let the pitch average and create the color on the spectrum and then from there create a triad or a palette. Let's make every business card reflect the voice of the card holder. Let's version every analog piece of stationery in a digital way so that everyone represents the voice recording of somebody else saying Third Coast Audio Festival. Let's take that voice and that recorded message and take it back and marry it with the audience itself. Let's fuse recipient and sender and make them coexist. Postcards and posters would be authentic in a way that most graphic design fails to be. And at the same time, it would be sort of in the canon and in the, the stream and continuum of what graphic design is. When the audience member wasn't there, the voice still is visual and the brand still resides. But every once in a while, there's the seminal project, the seminal project that comes along and moves me to a new path and says, OK, your gift, your experience, it's time now for a little bit of meaningful application. This tabloid for alternative think tank, do tank of urban planners and architects in Chicago had this spread. And in this spread had this fact, 2,000 gallons of fresh water leave Lake Michigan a day. 
and with them every 25th toilet flush in Chicago, sends raw sewage right down the Des Plaines River uh, to the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. Now that's real human presence. A hundred years ago, they changed the direction of the water so we weren't sending it into the lake. We could just send it to New Orleans every day. I was compelled to create moving design. It's a model of pedagogy at the intersection of experimentation and education. It's designed for initiatives and interventions to see if we can reshape public opinion. And right now we're beginning a six-week seminar. It's called Call to Action, Design Interventions on Water. Somewhere between 15 and 20 of what I think the best emerging professional artists, educators, activists have come together. Last night was our first night. This was their call. <laughs> My little flip camera. So you get the idea. Our first initiative through moving design is called One Drop. It is a 15 minute a day, three week curriculum for the intermediate learner in the Chicago public school system. It's designed to just raise uh, water consumption consciousness, apply a little personal responsibility. We think if we start them young, we can sort of like reshape a, a whole little uh, momentum these kids are asked to just monitor their own water usage. They're asked to record it in the classroom online. They can see, they can compete, they can sort of uh, uh, measure themselves against the others. Along with it comes a workbook. The workbook is both lessons and activities. And at the end of this workbook is a demonstration that a lot of littles make a big one drop at a time, and they can see the dramatic accumulation of their action. They can see that each day, that if they save and conserve water, they'll save 10 gallons a day, a tub's worth. If everybody in the class does the same, they'll save a car's worth. And if every kid in the CPS does it, they'll save four Sears towers full of water, fresh water a day. Also in this book, we have a letter to the governor. So it's like good citizenship. I encourage all of you to avoid formulaic methodologies and look inside to see if indeed the communications we foster and we bring to the humankind are full of real human presence. Let's bring life to form. I beg of you. Thank you.